So I'm probably a familiar face to most of you. So in case I'm not, Mario from Nest Corporation. Um, marketing guy, not technical, so this presentation is basically a sales and uh, purchasing decision presentation. Uh, there are 136 slides in this presentation because it does include a lot of the technical stuff, so uh, I'm kind of going to skip a few slides along the way. If you have any technical questions, uh, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability, but if there's something very technical that you want to know, uh, pass it on to Daniel, he'll flick it over to me and I'll get back to you. So, to kick things off, um, I'm going to present essentially buying decisions on what you could propose to a customer and possibly what a customer might have in his head in terms of what he wants in terms of a security and a CCTV system. And uh, these are the sorts of questions that uh, as a salesperson I get asked all the time and probably you guys get asked more often than not. Should I go wired? Should I go wireless? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go run coax? Should I run cat5? And uh, a lot of it's very subjective rather than objective. Um, there's no, not a wrong way or a right way of doing things. It's just a matter of preference and a matter of how much money you've got to spend. Um, and what you're prepared to outlay in terms of installation and so forth. So uh, um, there are pros and cons on both sides. So to kick things off, um, Nest manufactures, uh, has been manufacturing for 45 years, so we're kind of an old war horse in the industry. Uh, we're possibly the last electronics manufacturer in the country and uh, we manufacture for a number of OEMs as well, both locally and overseas. A uh, major one overseas is LQSA, who um, are a leading company in automation controllers. And if you haven't heard of it, we manufacture a product called the M1. In the States it's called an ELK controller. So the M1 basically interfaces to all the home automation systems that are popular throughout the world. AMX, Crestron, uh, Vantage, who has pretty much disappeared now. Control 4, which is huge uh, and probably got about 70% world market share. So, but today we're going to focus on, as I said, security systems and the most popular system we sell uh, is the D8 and the D16, which you can see the D8 boxes here. That's a D8. It comes in two flavours, an 8 zone and a 16 zone. You cannot upgrade the 8 to the 16, so you need to make a decision how many uh, zones you're going to have in your premises. Uh, most homes that are 3 and 4 bedroom do not need anything bigger than a D8. Uh, if you're going to go any larger than that, of course, go to the D16 and that gives you a few more, well, an, an extra 8 zones. So the D8 and the D16 are basically the same product. It's just that there's a daughter board that is soldered onto the, uh, uh, onto the original motherboard and that makes it a 16 zone system. Other than that, they're exactly the same. Uh, we're the only company in the country that offers a three-year warranty and that also covers hard drives by the way so if you purchase uh, through radio parts if uh, any of your customers are purchasing Hike Vision um, make it be aware that it's not a 12-month warranty on the hard drive from Ness it's three years which is pretty much unheard of so even if you purchased a hard drive from us say a six terabyte uh, ridiculously I think but we we offer a three-year warranty on that which uh, manufacturers don't actually offer a th three-year warranty on hard drives it's more like 12 months or 24 months so so the D8 and D16 can be optioned with three different keypads uh, by far the most popular uh, as of this year really I would say is the navigator keypad which is this one, it's the touchscreen keypad. There's not a huge price difference between the standard KPX keypad and the navigator, but there is a huge difference when it comes to installation because rather than being an alphanumeric keypad that tells you very little as you're programming, the navigator keypad guides you all the way through and it has the complete manual inside it. From a user's point of view, much, much simpler to use. It runs on icons, so it's very easy to understand what's going on, where you're at, and so forth. So for a very marginal difference in price, um, I would, you know, if you're selling, and even if you're buying, I would outlay the extra 17 or $20 to upgrade to a navigator keypad. The only reason I would think uh, there are some older folks who kind of not really into touchscreens perhaps um, and they like to press 
numbers and get that tactile feedback. Um, there are other cases where you might be installing in, let's say, a factory complex, warehouse, or somewhere where there's a lot of industrial grease and things like that. Touchscreens, as you know, don't particularly like that. So in those cases, you kind of run with the KPX keypad. The keypad in the middle was designed to match, we were supplying Clipsal at one stage, a lot of systems, and they were selling them at ridiculous pricing, so we pulled out of that market. But they have their uh, satin range of um, GPOs and uh, light switches and so forth. So we basically designed the satin keypad to kind of complement those, uh, not these days not hugely popular, I'd say out of all the keypads we sell, one in ten is a satin, maybe even less. Uh, they come in a couple of different flavours, you can get them in white, ocean mist, and we used to have black, but nobody buys black anymore. Um, it was popular, it was like uh, we were in, uh, everyone was asking us for black cameras, and that was a year and a half ago. And now, nobody wants black cameras, and we've got a few hundred of them stuck in the warehouse. So, <laughs> if anybody wants black cameras, let me know. Um, some of the features that you get on a D8 or D16, so as I said, 8 or 16 wired. Now, it is a hybrid system, which means that you can run it as a wireless, completely wireless. The frequency runs on 304 megahertz. It's a one-way frequency, so there's no confirmation of an event, and that's pretty standard amongst any wireless security system. Aside from an M1, I mentioned before, that is a two-way wireless protocol, so that runs at 902 to 928 megahertz, and that gives you a confirmation of the event. But on a standard security system, that doesn't happen. Uh, we have a thing called auto time automation, which is unique to us. If you want to go the extra nine yards, you can run this system as an automation system, a small automation system, uh, which means you can pre-program it through simple language to perform certain functions at certain times, so it's auto-timed. Uh, not a lot of security systems have that, but uh, our background being in automation, we felt that it was a good idea to have. Going one step further from that, we do have a pretty comprehensive CBUS interface. So if anybody's running CBUS lighting and they want some lighting control or they want to integrate with CBUS, um, there is a, a, a CBUS interface for the D8s and the D D16s. Don't sell a lot of them because once somebody goes to CBUS, they've already made the decision to dig deep in their pockets. And uh, as you know, CBUS is not, not cheap. You're looking at around six to $800 for a, a lighting controller module. So once they've made that decision, and then they're usually going to go for an M1 and then they're going to have Control 4 to aggregate the interface and so forth. But, handy to know. Auxiliary output, so if you want to drive something, um, for example, your roller doors for your garage and, and so forth, there's eight auxiliary outputs on D8s and D16s. Uh, we do have an output expander as well, gives you another eight. Uh, very rarely used because most of the time auxiliary outputs are really used for the roller door <laughs> and that's about it. Um, as I mentioned before, various keypad options. Uh, yes, you can operate by a smartphone. Um, it's a, at the moment, it's an optional extra. There are rumours that eventually we'll have it integrated into the panel, but you need to purchase a separate serial to Ethernet bridge to connect to your router. Uh, you download the app and it comes up on your handset and you can arm, disarm and unlatch doors via the handset. If there's a break-in, uh, you, your phone will ring and once you open the app, you'll be able to see which zones have been breached. At the moment, we don't have push notification. That's coming in the next generation of product that was meant to be released around January this year, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, that it will be basically the same system. I believe the 16 zone will be upgradable to 32. Um, and there will be an additional uh, three doors of access control, making altogether six doors of access control, which I'll get into a little later. Um, but uh, yeah, operation by smartphone, it does cost you $8 to download the uh, Android version and around $11, I think, to download the uh, uh, Android version. But, um, and push not notification is coming. The reason we haven't done it yet is because we don't believe in using somebody else's cloud technology to secure your home. And as recent events proved, Bosch and Dahua both got hacked because they were using servers in India. 
and uh, things went pretty sour for a lot of people that had Bosch security systems. Um, so we've built our own cloud servers, completely secured, and there's no way they're going to get hacked. Um, voice alarms and prompts, you can ring in and the system will prompt you by voice as to what you want to do. You simply press the appropriate button and the appropriate action happens. Um, access controls on board, you can have up to three doors of access control currently, um, which means that you can badge the door, it'll open, or if somebody's at your front door, and they want you to open it, they simply have to call you, you open up the app, you unlatch the door. Uh, wireless options, a complete range of wireless products. Uh, if you decide to go down that path or halfway down that path, half wired, half uh, uh, wireless, um, everything from uh, four button key fobs like these, which we call RK4s, you've probably all seen them, um, to your keychain fob like that, which you can just use to um, badge and nut badge to open and open the door, unlatch the door. Uh, easy programming via keypad, it's very true. Pretty much D8s and D16s are pre-programmed out of the box. This is your Bible. Never leave it with the customer, ever. Because pardon my friend style, so F around with it and you'll, you'll be getting callbacks and, and technical crap going on. So once you open this, I suggest you go straight to the back page, which is page uh, 87. And there you'll find what we call locations. They all start with a P. Once you get into programming mode, that's your Bible. It's cross-reference cross to the rest of the book, so you will be able to understand exactly what each of those locations does. Very, very simple. Now what I've done is I've taken that and I've highlighted the most important locations that you need to address to set up a basic system. If you need a copy of that, let me know. Happy to let Daniel have it, or I'm happy to leave this with Daniel and he can highlight it and hand it around. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, okay, I think uh, I'll move on from there. So this is your basic board layout. Now, uh, a security system is nothing more than inputs, outputs, and a processor in the middle. That's pretty much it. So your inputs are your zones, and things like your keypads. You might want to know how many keypads you can run on a D8 or D16. You can run up to four navigator keypads. You can't mix if you're going to run four. They have to be four navigators. Or you can run any mix of three. So you can run, for example, two navigators and one Saturn, uh, two KPX and one navigator. Uh, so on one side of the board you've got your inputs, including your strobe, your siren, tamper switch. Now, down the bottom here you'll notice there's a little jumper. And to get into program mode, uh, you power the system via the battery, you lift that jumper and you enter zero 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 and you're into installer program mode and that's the only way you can get into installer program mode um, on the other side you've basically got what we call the headers which I'll get into later so you've got your re the listen in header I wouldn't worry about too much nobody ever uses it but the receiver the auxiliaries which I mentioned before the serial and the reader are pretty important So I mentioned before the Navigator keypad, I think it's the best buy and the best sell. Um, as you can see, it runs a GUI, very simple to use. Um, yeah, just a couple of examples there. Uh, as it says, designed for the user with plain English, uh, events displays by um, it displays events by name. Uh, you can add your own text descriptions uh, for, for alarm zones, so you can have, for example, instead of having zone one, you can have lounge room, you can have dining room, and, and so on and so on. So the auxiliary outputs are programmable uh, by event or time. So, for example, you might have an event which would be, okay, when I arm the system, I want the hallway lights to turn off. Or you can say, okay, after I've entered and disarmed, uh, and I've been in here for 10 minutes, uh, I want you to turn the bedroom lights on, for example. So this is what we call our auto time 
uh, functions. Um, yeah, and much more. <laughs> so there's a little calendar in there. There's also a business card section where the installer should install his details and so forth. Uh, I don't know how many times we get phone calls from customers saying, oh, you know, I've just moved into a new house. Uh, I don't know how to arm the system. I don't have any codes. And the bugger hasn't left any details whatsoever. So the system basically has to be factory defaulted and reprogrammed from scratch, which costs money. So it's very, very important if any of you are installing um, or if you're dealing with contractors, they can tend to get a little lazy and they don't leave their details um, with the system. So as I said, the manual is your Bible. Uh, do not leave it with the customer, I'll repeat that. Um, it's, it, it's an amazing book, it has everything that opens and shuts, you can read it from start to finish, or you can skim through it, go to the, import, go to the important bits like how to power up, uh, how to factory reset, how, how to assign uh, uh, user codes and so forth, how to learn in remotes. Uh, it's very, very straightforward, it really isn't difficult. And in terms of programming, as I said, page 87, it's all cross-referenced back. Um, this is an example of some of those uh, highlighted programming areas that I was talking about. So, for example, P26E, you literally P26E, enter, um, and you can set your entry delay time. Now, these are all default. You can leave them all as default. You don't have to change them. They're in accord with uh, what the norm is, but if you need to change them, go ahead and do it. A uh, quick outline on the power-up procedure. So, as I said before, to enter install a program mode for the first time, um, you, you power up with the program tamper link off, which is that little jumper at the bottom right-hand corner of the board. Um, if the program tamper link is on and any other 24-hour zones are unsealed on power-up, the panel will immediately go on to, into alarm. So just be aware of that. It'll scare the hell out of everybody. But... Uh, this is all in the manual. I'm not going to go into great detail because we've only got like an hour and 15 minutes for this and I've still got to do CCTV. So, um, and anybody who wants a copy of this PowerPoint, you're welcome to it. Just ask Daniel and uh, I'll give him a copy before I leave and happy to hand it over to you. So some differences between in, uh, installer program mode and uh, user program mode. So users are restricted to uh, uh, access to all user codes, so they can change user codes. Uh, entry and exit times, so if they want to increase the exit time from 30 seconds to say three minutes or two minutes, they can do that. Uh, follow me telephone number, not used a lot, I'd pretty much ignore that. And the real time clock settings of course, so if you wanted to change the clock settings. Uh, and that's pretty much what user program mode restricts them to, whereas if you leave this, with the installer code, it's open slather. Bad news. Because you know what people are like. The more you give them, the more they try and the more they screw up. Uh, okay, as I said, I'm just going to skip a few of these as we go. Now, that's the jumper that I was talking about. It's just at the bottom right hand corner of the board. So, to get into uh, uh, installer mode, um, you remove that jumper and enter 000000, and you're into uh, program mode. And with a navigator touchscreen, it's, it's a piece of cake. Programming, you can do it uh, remotely uh, through a free software called Nescoms, or you can do it locally via a serial hookup to the panel via your laptop. Um, I don't recommend either. I think it's a lot easier to, you know, to program through a navigator keypad. What a lot of installers do is if somebody's ordered a standard KPX keypad, they carry a navigator keypad in their, in their trunk or in their van. Uh, they'll program with the navigator. They'll remove it. Well, they don't even install it. They just plug it in, unplug it, put in the KPX and walk away. Uh, you probably save around 30 minutes at least, programming via Navigator Keypad. Uh, well, I won't go into that. Okay, so 
some of the optional accessories for a D8 and D16. Now, if you want to go wireless, we have what's called a 100-200 radio interface, which is this little box here. And that enables the system through the receiver header. If you remember, I pointed out to some headers on the main board, and there was a receiver header. You literally plug that into the receiver header. It's a plug and play procedure, and you're ready to adopt wireless devices. Um, that comes in two formats. You can get it on its own for X amount of dollars, or you can get it uh, once again on its own, but with two radio key fobs, which is the most popular. We call it a kit. So you get two of those. One for the husband, one for the wife, um, and I mean, you guys are radio parts sell a lot of those. I'm, I've noticed many of those go through the door. So um, now, in terms of door access control, you require two products. Uh, you require what's called a Wigand interface, and you also require what's called a four by relay. The Wigand interface is so that it understands how to read a prox reader which has a Wigand output, so it's purely kind of a, um, a format that it understands how to read. The 4x relay is simply to unlatch your door. So there's four relays on there, you have three doors, you use three relays. That's simple as that. Uh, Wigand uh, interface, you notice there's three headers here for three doors. Now there's also something called a portable download tool. If you find you're doing 300 apartments or 50 apartments or 20 apartments and the programming's pretty much the same except for the user codes, then you can use the Nest uh, portable download tool. It's kind of like a USB but not. So it downloads all the information from your first install and you simply go upload, 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 upload. Just remember to change the user codes otherwise the next door neighbor's gonna watch your wife showering. Um, oh, didn't get a laugh out of that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we'll skip this. Well, this is just simply telling you how to arm and disarm. I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple. To arm, you press arm, enter. Now, that is if you have an arming shortcut enabled. In the programming, you can actually um, arm via a shortcut, so you don't actually have to put in the code. I would advise against it. Uh, I don't particularly like it. I think uh, learning the code is very, very important. Um, I, I don't see any reason why you'd want to do that, to be honest. Um, but if you do want to disarm, you have to enter the code. So it's kind of whatever. Um, a lot of people have asked if I have a radio key and I arm and disarm by the radio key. If I lose the radio key, what if someone else finds it? You're in deep shit. They will be able to get into your house, they will be able to rob you blind, and we are not responsible for that. So basically, guard it with your life. Um, if you happen to lose it, call your install installer immediately and he'll learn in a new one. Um, in the meantime, don't leave home. Okay, something that I get asked a lot of questions about, PIRs. Which PIRs? There are so many PIRs on the market. What's the fundamental difference? Which one should I use? So on and so on. How many times I walk into a place and they've got like a four or five metre ceiling and there's this PIR sitting there, I mean, that's not going to do jack. Okay, so the maximum height that you should install a PIR is 2.4 metres. Now, there's a bit of tolerance there. You can go to around 2.8, even 3, provided it's angled to hit the floor. If a PIR is angled in such a way, just looking into space, what do you reckon is going to happen? There's no reference point. A PIR needs to refer reference. Apparently, a PIR inside is basically uh, a couple of lenses and some mirrors. So it needs to bounce off and bounce back, and it's doing that all the time, so it's referencing itself. Once that reference is interrupted, then it goes into alarm. You've broken the seal, you've, you've broken the zone. So very, very important to pick the right PIR. Now there's cheap PIRs, there's really cheap PIRs, there's reasonable PIRs, and there's really good PIRs. So 
at the bottom of, well, I'm not saying this is a horrible PIR, but personally, I wouldn't put it in my place. Uh, it's the cheapest PIR we sell. Um, it is, uh, has a range of 12 metres, which is pretty reasonable, but it's a single lens PIR. So what happens with a single lens PIR, it has no comparisons. So false alarms, it's more apt to false alarms. By the way, if you are installing PIRs, always make sure they're on a bit of an angle. So they have, as I said before, they need to reference the floor. And other things to watch out for are shiny surfaces because infrared bounces back. So it's, if it's going over a shiny surface, like a, a very glossy table or a glass top table or whatever, you'll find you get false alarms. Never point PIRs at one another, big mistake. All you're gonna do is have the siren going off every five minutes. Sunlight, avoid direct sunlight, bad news. Um, so single lens PIR, the cheapest, um, does it do the job? Yeah, it's okay, it, it works. Um, but there's only one lens and as I said, it's more prone to, it has a slightly shorter range and it's more prone to, to false alarms. Probably the most popular um, PIR we sell, uh, I would say would be the Nest Lux. Both these PIRs are quad lens, so they're the four lens PIR. Um, they will detect anything better than anything else and much less likely chance of false alarms. Uh, 15 metre range um, at around a 45 degree angle. So um, very important to mount them at the right height, otherwise your range is going to be shorter. If you mount them anything above three metres, they simply won't work. So if somebody breaks in, then very little chance they're going to pick him up. Um, so X-Line series, that's a dual lens PIR as opposed to a single lens. If you want something a little cheaper, I'd definitely run with the dual lens and not the single lens. Um, now you've probably heard about dual technology or dual tech PIRs. Any, anyone know what the difference might be? Which is? Yes, correct. So they're picking up both. Microwave as well as infrared. In terms of practical sense, they're picking up motion as well as heat. So if, if you have an area that needs some pretty good protection, that's the best way to go. So I would recommend any retail, factories, whatever, to run dual tech PIRs. Any, th any area that you want, you know, you've got valuable stuff and you really want it protected, I would run with those. These basically work like an ant, don't they? You know, it's this and that. Correct. Correct. Yep, correct. Yep. Uh, I've been asked many times about pet aware. Yes, there are pet aware PIRs. If you've got anything over 20 kilos, forget it. It's not going to do any good. It's going to treat it like a human being and it will set off the alarm. So I don't know of any PIRs that run over 20 kilo masses. I don't know what you call it. Maybe if you have a pig for a pet, you're in trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> I know a lot of Greeks that do, but anyway. <laughs> well, it's more like sheep. <laughs> goats. <laughs> um, okay, we carry the, we have, Ness actually manufactured a 360 PIR, so it literally means 360, so you're getting 360 degrees of coverage on a 15 metre radius. Once again, the ceiling height matters. If it's going to be over 3 metres or 2.8 metres, uh, you're going to be in trouble. We also carry the full range of TACX PIRs. Has anybody heard of TACX? They're the premium company globally that makes uh, all sorts of things like beam detectors, PIRs, absolutely Rolls-Royce stuff. So if you have a premises that runs a ceiling height of 5 metres up to 8 metres, look at TACX. They ain't cheap. You're talking for a 5 metre PIR around about 350 bucks, and for an 8 metre PIR you're looking upwards of 500 bucks. But that's great technology. Uh, outdoor PIRs, curtain PIRs, uh, all from TACX. So they have an amazing outdoor PIR. If you've got a couple of dogs running around the backyard and they're around 20 kilos, it works really, really well. It's IP66, uh, sorry, IP67, so it's dustproof, weatherproof, everything. Not overly expensive, it's around 200 bucks. 
and it gives you around a 30 metre range, so it will cover a decent sized backyard. Does the curtain repeat PIR, does that tell you if you can... Wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> no, you serious? <laughs> no. No, no. Curtain PIR, it literally lays a curtain of um, infrared. So, very handy. Very handy to use, for example, in that doorway there. Uh, if you want to know who's coming in and out. Uh, if you want to know how many 26-inch uh, um, TV or 56-inch TVs Mario's walked out with. Pretty good. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel, I didn't mean it. <laughs> Wireless. Um, we have uh, pretty much enough in the PIR range to satisfy almost every application in terms of wireless PIR. You're not going to go crazy wireless without door stuff, but TACX do make a reasonably good, actually a very, very good um, outdoor wireless PIR. Uh, in terms of ourselves, we manufacture the... Um, um, Lux wireless PIR, same technology as the hardwired, it's a quad lens. Um, it runs on the 304 megahertz frequency, so it's a one-way protocol. If anyone's unsure what that means, put your hand up. Okay. Um, and it's a great product because you can run it both ways. You can make it pet aware or not pet aware. There's a little slide you put over the lens and it makes it pet aware or not pet aware. So. Um, we also manufacture the new 902 to 928 megahertz two-way. It's not suitable for the D8s or D16s, it's actually designed for the M1 and also for a new product coming out called Mezzo. <laughs> Whatever that's going to be. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, it's very close, very, very close. Um, read switches. Everybody's familiar with what read switches are? All right. When you want to read a book, you need to switch. Okay. So. Two types of read switches. One is supervised, the other one is not. Does anybody know what the difference is between a supervised read? Okay, supervised read means if somebody leaves the door open for a certain amount of pre-programmable time, so you can actually program this, it will set off an alarm, which is pretty good. So if the kids have left the house and they've left the door open, that seal may not be broken because it was never closed to begin with because the system was disarmed, right? And they leave it open and you you'll never know. So that's the difference between a supervised radio read and, and a... Now, this is larger. It has a better range. It is more expensive. Uh, the micro radio read, uh, I wouldn't install those unless you're within, in a normal house, probably around about 20 metres of the radio receiver. So, now bear in mind with the radio receiver, you can be around... A, about three or four metres away from the box itself. And that brings me to the point, try of avoid, try to avoid putting the radio receiver inside the box. The one reason we don't make metal boxes for, for the D8s and D16s is purely because of that radio range. Uh, some of our competitors, they say, oh, we've got a metal box. Oh, really? Okay, so what happens if you put the radio receiver in there? You're kind of screwed. Um, but try avoid doing it anyway. Um, there, there's a decent sized lead on that uh, radio receiver, so you can put it like three or four metres away. It'll work beautifully. In terms of radio range, um, in a normal household with PIRs, you're looking somewhere between 30 and 40 metres maximum distance. So if you do have a problem with that, we do have a solution, which I'll come across. So is everybody clear about all that? Okay. Smoke alarms. Um, we have two different radio smoke detectors. Both of them um, are actually CSIRO approved. So they meet um, Australian building standards and also smoke detector standards. Um, the one that you would use with a D8 or D16 if you wanted to go radio on a smoke alarm would be this one, the 106040, because it runs the 304 megahertz frequency. Um, we also have uh, rate of rise detection. Does anybody know what that is? Rate of rise detectors? Okay, so let's say you're running a restaurant and you're in the kitchen. Where would you put a smoke alarm, do you reckon? Outside the door from 
Who said that? Where would you put it? Just outside the door of where the kitchen is. Why is that? Just so then the smoke comes out and it alerts it. Otherwise it would detect everything inside there. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Rate of rise, you'd put it as close to the heat as possible. So if you're cooking here, your rate of rise detector should be there. All it does is detect a rapid rise in temperature. So that will set off an alarm. So I've seen so many kitchens, in commercial kitchens, uh, like in pizza shops and things like that, and the smoke alarm is almost right next to the oven. And I think, oh, what the hell? <laughs> but anyway, so it's, it's just all these sort of things that when it comes to an installation are really, really bloody important. And, and they're kind of negated because all, all this guy wants to do is get in and out as quickly as possible and make his $800 for the day for installing a, a system. But it's, it's no good installing some, something if it's installed incorrectly. And then guess what? Radio parts get the blame because, oh, you sold us bum gear and then it comes back to us and we're going, no, what the hell, where was this installed and so on and so on. So um, it's pretty important to give the right advice for the right product. Okay, reed switches. What a mess. What, how, many, how many of you guys have uh, either installed or sold radio switches, uh, reed switches? You have? So what's the first question someone asks you when they want to buy a reed switch? They don't know, right? Yeah, they want it small, they want it yeah. scary, they want it invisible. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pretty hard to do, but there is a reasonably good range with Ness. Um, probably these, in terms of a swinging door, are, are the most popular, and they're relatively invisible. Pretty hard to detect. Um, sliding doors, you sold any for sliding doors? Roller reeds, yeah, so roller reed for sliding door. They come in a number of colours, black, beige, I think, and white. Um, Roller reed for your roller shutter door. Um, pretty important, I think. Um, you know, most, most guys that sort of automate their roller door through a D8 or whatever, they usually install one of those in case it's open, it sets an alarm off. So, um, just very quickly, we have another reed switch which we call a universal transmitter, the RR2. It's kind of a combined product. It's a standalone product, so meaning it runs on a 9 volt battery. You can actually learn in virtually any radio device. So if you wanted, for example, to automate your roller door but you don't have a D8, this is the way to go. If you wanted to hook up up to one, two, three additional devices, so for example a vibration sensor. Has anybody installed a solar a vibration sensor? Okay, well if you do, the first thing you need to tell them is RTFM, read the effing manual, and calibrate it correctly. Because if they're not calibrated co correctly, as soon as the window starts to move a little with a bit of wind, it's going to set off the vibration sensor if it's on a very sensitive setting. So, But uh, having said that, uh, for example, you can have a push button into one of the inputs here. Uh, you can have a reed switch, an additional reed switch, you can have an additional three reed switches. So it's pretty much a standalone um, transmitter that if you had a D8, it would then transmit whatever output has been triggered back to the D8 to set off an alarm. So it acts both as a reed switch and a transmitter. I know it's a little hard to get your head around that, but um, uh, there's some examples here. Uh, so external reed switch, cool room door, you know, ceiling manhole. It's pretty, pretty. Uh, um, but the nest sensor, which is the vibration sensor, so for doors, window frames, cars in car yards, display cases in shops. They're not expensive. They're pretty cheap, and they work very, very well. Any questions on that? All right. So I mentioned before about range on transmission and I personally have you know seen this myself and I, I was absolutely amazed um, I got a, we got a line of sight just with the little transmitter here this was on a uh, plant nursery farm right it was about 150 to 200 meters I, I was blown over um, but if you're in a confined space Let's say in a normal home, if you've got solid brick walls and concrete walls, if you're in an apartment or whatever, of course that cuts back the radio range. So 
The first thing you want to do before going and spending money on a radio repeater, which are not cheap, um, you want to try a high gain antenna. And that usually solves your problem. For example, if your um, key fob, as you're approaching home, you press it and the, door, the, the roller door's not opening, the garage door's not opening because you've got poor range um, from your radio interface. So what you want to do is get a high gain antenna and put it somewhere around where the garage is and you'll find that'll solve your problem. Pretty rarely happens but it does happen depending on how many trees are in the way, what the terrain's like and stuff like that. Radio repeater, what it essentially does is literally repeat the signal so it's an amplifier and you can have up to three of those um, it, plus the wireless uh, interface, so you can have up to three radio repeaters um, in an installation, which will give you a range roughly in a normal home if you put three of those somewhere between 60 to 100 metres. Uh, line of sight, if you had three of those, you'll probably get about 300 metres. It's pretty damn good. Um, flexible receiver. Um, it's pretty much what the wireless receiver is, except uh, you have four open, con collect connect blah, blah, open collector outputs. So you can drive stuff with it. Uh, a little bit more expensive, uh, very, very handy if you're planning on uh, controlling a, a garage door or, or, or whatever. Um, you, you can use a flexible receiver. Uh, just to recap, so your zones and your keypads and your siren and so forth on this side and on this side are all your headers that we mentioned before. So your reader header, what do you reckon your reader header would uh, be used for? What would you plug into your reader header, do you reckon? The weekend. Weekend? Good. Yep. Uh, what do you reckon you plug, plug into your serial header? That's it. Leads, Bingo. Internet interface. Correct. Uh, receiver header? So, yep. Pretty, it's self-explanatory and it's actually printed on the damn board so it's pretty hard to get wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that's where your receiver goes. and also your flexible receiver. So as you said before, your door control, that's your Wiegand interface. Um, now in terms of readers, without going into too much detail, uh, I think you probably all, aware, all are aware there's a number of formats that readers have. The basic format is EM and the next format on top of that is MyFair and then you have what's called Desfire. So Desfire is a very high security protocol. So Desfire gives you about uh, uh, 128 million combinations. Down at the bottom end, which is what you get here, is EM format. So EM format gives you about 26,000 combinations, which means that one person in 26,000 is going to have this, be able to access your door. I know it's a small, relatively small risk, but when it comes to government departments and so on and so on, their minimum standard is uh, MyFair. Uh, MyFair gives you in the millions. So there's very little chance that anyone else is going to be able to badge your door and get in. Um, in terms of copying, what's on that fob on this? EM format's the easiest. You can go on the internet and buy a little device that you wear on you, you go past the person's thing, say within a metre, it'll read it, it'll crack it, and you'll be able to burn these and open his door. And that, that has happened more often than not. <laughs> yeah. So when you hear about all these uh, break-ins, how did they get into the room, how did they get past the access control, blah, blah, there's always a way to do it. So, but for, I mean, for your average Joe, your average house, things like that, EM format's fine. Um, so we have a number of different readers here. Um, I don't know if I've got a picture of this one, but this is purely a reader. This is both a reader and a pin pad, and you can have both. 
So you've got two levels of security. You can put a pin in and then badge it, and that gives you entry. Or you can use this standalone as well. So if you don't have a D8 or a D16 and you just want some door access control with a door latch, you can wire this into the door latch, latch power it, select the pin number, program the pin number in, so they just press whatever, four, four, say 1111, right, and it'll open the door. So quite a, and these are IP66, uh, sorry, IP67. Um, so they're relatively vandal proof, uh, they can take a bit of a hammering, and they're completely weatherproof. They come in two different formats, by the way. You can have them more or less square, uh, or you can have them as a rectangular. Now your 4 by relay board, as I mentioned before, is essential if you're going to need to, for example, trigger a garage door to open or, or whatever. So if you're planning on doing a uh, garage door installation, um, you must have a 4 by relay board uh, connected to the, to the D8. Okay, connecting to the internet, um, we have what's essentially a serial to ethernet bridge. You do need to understand how to port forward to run one of these, so port forwarding is essential. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls about port forwarding, we don't address them. So I'm sorry, we're not here to solve your, your LAN problems. You learn how to go on to portforwarding.com, look up the uh, uh, router that you have, and that will guide you step by step how to port forward. Um, so once again, just connect to your router. Um, this is actually a little kit called the K-6002D kit, which Radio Parts orders quite a few of. Um, CBUS interface that I mentioned before. Now, question is, if I've installed this on the serial header and the customer wants a CBUS interface, there's only one header. Problem? No. <laughs> there are serial repeaters here, four of them. So it solves your problem. Oh yeah. Oh, I am thorough. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned before that you could use a flexible receiver uh, as a standalone to a roller door, and that's how it's done on the right-hand side. Very simple. Right? So remember this had some um, outputs and it's also a radio receiver so you can run it completely standalone. If you want to go via a D8 which is the normal way to go, I've, I've very rarely ever seen this but via the D8 so you'll need the 4x relay board, uh, you'll need the two key fobs and the receiver um, and optionally, the read switch. Because if somebody opens that door or forces it open, there's not going to be an alarm set off unless you have that read switch there. So probably a good idea to sell it as a little bundle. You get the read switch, you get this, you get that. So call it a garage door solution or whatever. All right, so this was what I was talking about before. Um, one thing that I didn't mention in terms of door access control is your power supply. So a lot of customers don't use it. Um, they don't have a battery backup. Um, I think it's ridiculous. You, you definitely need to have battery backup here in case there's a power failure. Now, in case there's a power failure, what do you think that those door latches should be? Normally closed or normally open? In other words, power off, normally closed, or normally open? Depends if you're worried about a fire or not. Depends if... <laughs> yeah, well, if you want to burn people alive, uh, I would say normally closed. So the doors lock when there's a fire. Bad idea. Unless it's a specific area. Let's say, for example, in the old days, I don't know if they do it now, but they used to have what's called halogen gas in uh, computer rooms. 
and the halogen gas would be released, consume all the oxygen in the room and put the fire out. In the meantime, if you're locked in that room, you're kind of screwed, unless you can hold your breath for a really long time. Um, so just to recap, three doors of access control. Um, you need the reader, either one of those or one of those. You need the door latch. Now, there's two types of door latches or door strikes that you can get. You can get monitored and non-monitored. What do you reckon the difference might be? And there's a fair cost difference as well. Yeah, because they've been open for too long. Bingo. Yeah. So, kind of if, if it's an area that you really need some decent monitoring on and decent sort of awareness of what's going on, you'd need a monitored door latch or door strike. Um, selecting the right door strike can be pretty tricky and we kind of wash our hands clean of it. We, I get a lot of guys coming in and they say, oh, I need it, or oh, how big's the door? Oh, well, you know, and they draw this thing and it looks like whatever and there's no dimensions on it and you give them what you think is right and then they come back, oh, it's too big or it's too small or whatever. So um, if you're selling, I would say, I'm sorry, the decision's yours, take it. That's it. If you're buying, make sure you know the dimensions of the door because they do vary. Aluminium doors, wooden doors, all that sort of thing. You know, from building to building, they can vary. We have quite a, a variety of door strikes. We have drop bolts, um, magnets, like that. Um, with magnets, you need to select how many pounds of force. Uh, they range between 300 and 1,200 pounds of force. Um, 1200 is almost impossible to move, 300, I, I couldn't do it, but um, yeah. Any questions there? No? Okay. Alright, um, you guys sell bucket loads of these, Daniel's always ordering them and that's not by accident, uh, the MBN's rolling out, every single security system out there cannot dial out on the MBN. Depends really, I'll quantify that. Uh, when the MBN rolls out, if it's fibre to the home, it will not dial out at all. If it's um, fibre to the node and then copper from there to the home, it's on and off. So as Murphy's Law would have it, it will probably be off when somebody breaks in. So the quickest, quick, quickest, quickest and easiest solution is to go 3G, uh, 3G GSM dialer. Um, Probably a good idea to power these from the panel. Can anyone guess why? Bingo. Yep. Um, now, with the new generation of product coming out <coughs> this year sometime before Christmas, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> these will be built into the panel. And it will be the only panel on the planet that has it, period. There's no other panel in the world that will have a built-in 3GSM dialer, which is kind of um, strange, but there you go. Um, I guess in Germany they don't need them because I think all of Germany's internet is wireless, right? Yeah. They went, they went wireless. They did the smart thing. They don't have to dig ditches. They just put up towers. A um, couple of alternatives. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the R16. Namely because it will not dial out on MBN and there is no solution for it. So you cannot run a 3G GSM on this. But as a low-cost, integrated, completely wireless 16-zone system, it's pretty good value for money. So if somebody's moved into an apartment or, or whatever and they don't want to run cables everywhere uh, and so on and so on, um, does it work well? Yeah. Makes a hell of a noise. Um, has some pretty good feature sets. Runs all of the uh, wireless devices that Nest has. Reasonably good product. So. Just a few key features there, built-in keypad, uh, has a built-in piezo siren, so if you don't want to go to the bother of having a radio siren, you don't have to. Uh, it's all built in. Supports up to 16 PIRs and 14 radio keys. Um, yep, and so on and so on. So it's a uh, fairly reasonable solution for somebody that doesn't want to spend a whole lot of money installing and running cables. Um, anyone familiar with this? Yeah. It's, a, it's an amazingly great product, I tell you. I, I reckon it's one of the best products we have, and it's a product that's totally undersold. 
Uh, at one time, we were selling 5,000 of these a month uh, during the FAI days, and they were running 2G, and they were just hugely popular. Are they ugly? Yes. <laughs> but if you have a boat, a caravan, a farmer's shed, tool sheds, whatever, uh, it's, a, it's a product that will run four months on a battery, so you only need to charge it every four months. It'll run 24 zones, all of our radio devices. Um, extremely easy to program, in fact it's, you, it's prompted by the LED, you just have to follow the instructions. It talks to you, there's two-way voice, um, a bunch of features. Um, very, very good value for money. It comes fully integrated, so the, there's, a radio, there's a PIR already in it, so if you just wanted to use it for a student apartment, you can just mount it in the corner. It has a siren built in, it runs at 118 dB, so it'll blow the ears off any, an elephant. Um, as I said, you can dial in, uh, you can change programming by dialing in. It's, it's a very, very powerful product, but I think because of the looks of it, it's not overly popular in your average home. Can you put it in a cupboard? Yes, you can. If you want to hide it, put it in a cupboard, but you lose the PIR. So, just a few other features there. So yeah, so it actually speaks to the user to report on system status and advises on action to take. Very powerful. And the 3G modem is actually built in. Okay, something new, which is coming out very shortly, uh, is METSO. This is a very long story. Uh, back in 2015, we released this product. Uh, we actually got product of the year at ASIAL. Um, however, at that time, Z-Wave was not mature enough for this market from the States because it was running 60 hertz frequency. So when we released METSO and it went out to trial, it failed terribly. Um, we weren't getting automation working, it was just horrible. So we had to wait until there was a 50 hertz version of, uh, of Z-Wave and that involved a lot of reprogramming and recalibration and a lot of crap went on and we basically completely redesigned um, the application. Um, so what is it? It's a product that, and it's the only product in the world of this type that has an integrated security system. So you've all heard of Google Home the dot and so forth, Alexa, okay, they do not have a security system. Um, fun devices, very good, but what do I want? A product of that nature if there's no security system in it. So what you need to do with those products is to interface them with another security system. So guess what? You just doubled your money. So for 399 bucks retail, Metso, 128 zones of security, 255 automation devices, two-way voice, interfaces to our medical call systems, in case you didn't know, Ness has a very large division called SmartLink, which uh, manufactures and, and supplies nurse call systems, medi alarms, pendants, all that type of thing. So Metso interfaces to a little base, SmartLink base, and uh, in case an older person falls over or whatever, uh, if, if they have the pendant, which has a little G-Shock in it, it'll contact METSO, METSO will start dialing numbers, whatever numbers you put in there. First number it's going to dial is triple zero, and then it'll start dialing family, whatever. Once somebody picks up, extremely sensitive mic, you could be basically in another room, and you'll be able to talk, and they'll hear you. Why? Because there's a 3G modem built in. So it goes over the cellular network. So it's a very, very smart device. Um, it also has Wi-Fi built in. So what we're releasing is a product called ViewHoo. And these are very cheap. I won't tell you how much, <laughs> but they are very cheap. They're a pan-tilt camera. Uh, they're high-resolution 2.1 megapixel. 
Um, they run wireless, you just need to get power to them. Um, and these marry up with Mezzo. So any other wireless cameras running 802 or Letso. So this is something that's kind of coming out, well it was meant to be out already but Nest being run by engineers, um, unless it's absolutely 100% they won't release it. So it's, you know, we're late, I know, and we've been beaten by companies like EnviroNexus who went through a huge learning curve with a certain electrical retailer that I won't, or wholesaler that I won't mention, uh, and they basically got it right at the end. I think EnviroNexus works relatively well, except for one thing. If you decide to arm the system, it's going to take 30 seconds to a minute to happen. Why? Because it relies heavily on the cloud, not Mezzo. Mezzo, all the smarts are built in. So you arm it, bang, it's armed. You disarm it, bang, it's disarmed. You want to dim that light, bang, it's done. So these are all the key selling features that Mezzo has that the competition doesn't. Um, and I think they're very important selling features. So yeah. Best award, best product, new product award, 2015. Okay, three years later, we're still going, but <laughs> it'll happen. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, best new product that didn't happen award. <laughs> that, that one. Uh, so as I said, security, automation. So what can you do with Z-Wave? Basically everything. It's not a piece of cake. So enrolling Z-Wave products in the competition takes three to four processes. With Metso it takes one. So we got it down to one process to learn in. Simply, you open the app, you go into learn in mode, you name it, you hold the app next to the um, device that's either a dimmer or whatever it is, and it learns it in. As simple as that. There is no back end to Metso. Everything is programmed through the front end. Is it DIY? Mm, kind of, kind of not, because it depends on how complex you want to go. If you want things like perimeter fencing and a bunch of automation, you'll need to get somebody in to do it. But I think this is kind of where the future is, where you've moved into a premises and you just don't want to spend the money on CBUS, you don't want to spend the money on running cables and so on and so on, but you want a relatively future-proof but progressive system, so you could do one circuit only. You could just pay 80 bucks for a dimmer and do one circuit. And then when you get a bit more money, pay another 80 bucks, you get a little more money. So in terms of retail, it's good recurring revenue. Because once you've sold the can, then the rest follows. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, guys get hooked on. And I think once the wife appreciates what it does, she'll quite like it too. Yeah, CCTV. Well, we also have a doorbell, which, by the way, Daniel has been completely revamped and it actually works. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, we had a delivery of a sample that came down and um, it's, it got tested in the office and it kind of works quite well. So, yeah. Now, the other important thing about Metso is energy management. Um, you can get two types of products with Z-Wave. Uh, one that doesn't measure the energy that's being consumed on that particular circuit and another one that does. So if you have the one that does, you can measure the amount of energy being consumed per kilowatt hour and it'll be displayed on your interface. Um, or you can get a, what they call a clamp and clamp it on your uh, cable that goes into the smart meter and that measures the energy for the whole house period. It's a Z-Wave device and you just get an overall energy consumption. Um, but by default, if you buy energy management uh, um, devices for Z-Wave, and most of them are, uh, you'll, you'll get energy, energy management, which is pretty handy. And as I mentioned before, health. And that concludes the D8, D16 presentation. Uh, do we have any time? Run out? That's it? Okay, so no, no CCTV for you. <laughs> Any questions? Not you. <laughs> Go on, Kenny. <laughs>
five minutes that you have, you can introduce the new IP camera kit. Ah, um, I have one in my car. Do you want me to go get it? Oh, sorry, I just think mine. Okay, so we've released a new IP camera kit. Uh, it's manufactured by Hike Vision, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> just like I didn't tell anyone, because we're not supposed to tell anyone because Hike Vision doesn't want it to go retail. But I'm telling you anyway, it is manufactured by Hike Vision. In fact, the spare cameras that you buy for it, they're in a Hike Vision box. So. It's the only kit of its nature that is 4 megapixel. It runs a 3 terabyte hard drive. If you go to Dahua, you'll find that they're 1 terabyte hard drive and they're 2.1 megapixel. So in addition to that, the cameras are IP67. Um, and they're, they're a very nice, solid bodied camera. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing value for money kit. I don't think, I don't think you're going to get any cheaper for banks for bucks. So, in a nutshell, getting onto CCTV, what are the advantages, do you guys reckon, of running coax, over running, let's say you just moved into a house, and there's no CCTV, like my son, that's what he did, right, and I gave him actually a coax kit, and then his electrician mate came and goes, oh, what have you got coax for? No, it should be running IP, I said to him, why? Can anyone give me a really good reason why you would pay twice the money? to run IP over coax. Aside from getting 4 megapixel, oh by the way very soon there's going to be 5, well there is already 5 megapixel coax, there is now power over coax, we just got a new range of cameras in by the way which are POC, but we only have one DVR that runs POC and there'll be more coming. So let's say at the end of the day you've got this comparison so you've got power over Ethernet and you've got power over coax. You've got 5 megapixel and you've got 5 megapixel. What are you going to run? This is 800 bucks, this is 400 bucks. Oh, it's a lot easier to pull Cat5. Really? I don't know. I don't see a lot of difference. In fact, if you look at the problem is, nobody looks at the image side by side. If you took a 5 megapixel, 2.8 millimeter uh, TVI camera, and you took the same 5 megapixel IP camera, and you put it on the same monitor side by side, you would notice a difference in the image. Not sorry? Not shielding related? No. The difference in the image is that there's more artifacts on IP than there are on coax. If you go into any television station, are they running IP? Really? No. All their cameras are running coax. For starters, uh, yeah, that's quite, it's true. Now, reasons to run IP are really good. So, if it's a new build, absolutely run IP because you're going to cable the place and you're going to have IP everywhere, right? So you're going to have Cat5 everywhere, fine. Second good reason, analytics. You don't get analytics on coax. So if you're going into a retail environment, if you want ANPR cameras for um, number plate recognition, facial recognition, uh, POS interface, statistics, how many people are left in the building, how many people left, blah, 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 all that, absolutely you would run IP. If you're going to install a 64, 32 channel system, go IP. But if you're going to install the average Joe, he wants, you know, a, reason, a budget price system that performs pretty well, there's nothing wrong with coax. However, if the customer comes to you and says, you know what, I want an IP kit, by all means, sell it to them. There's no argument, really. I'm just saying that TVI and coax get a bit of a whipping for no real good reason, because it does produce some pretty good results, and I, for one, cannot figure out why they manufacture 20 times the product in IP as they do to TVI, and yet IP is still twice the price. I don't get it, but that's the way it is. So there's no real disadvantage to running coax. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, uh, I mean, some of those kits, that four camera kit, Daniel, I mean, that is pretty good value for money. And, and I mean, people get rather spoiled because what are you watching on your TV at home? You're watching 1080p. 
That's 2.1 megapixel. Oh, the image is fantastic. I love Blu-ray. But all of a sudden you get this buzzword called 4K. I, I need 4K. Why do you need 4K? <laughs> Why? Really? It's just because we're creatures of um, wants rather than needs. So it's, uh, it's kind of easy to, um, to make that quantum leap to spend more money. I, I understand that. But I'm just trying to point out that there's really nothing wrong with coax. So if, and, and it just depends on how you market the product. If you market it correctly, you'll find that it, they'll channel themselves and, and both will sell rather well. But I better shut up now.